Uh, so I'm going to yeah I'm going to go over a couple of projects today, uh, both optical. Uh, one of them you can see, one of them you cannot see. Um, I have some samples here of the one you can see and the one you can't see. So this is probably going to be more interesting uh, <laughs> if you can uh, if you don't have see-through vision. So. Uh, as Michael mentioned, uh, 3D printing is something that's kind of well and truly arrived. I just got back from CES and uh, it was a real sort of fiesta of different companies that are coming out with different 3D printing and it's really uh, sort of has its own zone at CES this year, so it's, it's, it's really arrived. Will I Am was recently announced as the sort of cre uh, chief creative officer for 3D systems, so uh, that gives you any indication of what's going on uh, out there in the 3D printing industry. It's, it's really interesting. So, but if we look at it from, I guess, the, the research side, uh, not many people are sort of too familiar, I think, with things that are going on in the industry to really scale uh, 3D printing up. So uh, this is one example of a really large uh, mass production prototype uh, by a research institute in the Netherlands uh, called TNO, and it's this concept uh, that the you know in the, in the process of fabricating uh, to create you know individual objects really really quickly uh, that are all different and creating them on on the sort of production line. Uh, so this this sort of hasn't really gone uh, unannounced, uh, you know, by some really high up people, um, and there's a big sort of movement I think to really bring back. Uh, the making, uh, the manufacturing, and doing things like in a new and really different way uh, right here. So uh, printed optics, and, and I think the work I'm going to talk about today is this, this movement from assembling these individual you know, pieces and to make a device. Uh, so how do we go from that, from being assembled, uh, to being uh, printed uh, in their entirety? And, and that's, that's kind of no, no easy feat. but I'm going to talk about one specific area of, of work I've done uh, in this space, uh, and that relates to using uh, optics. And this is a commercially available uh, material uh, printed on a commercially available machine uh, with a lot of sort of hand sanding afterwards. Uh, but that gives you some sort of idea of, of what you can get out of uh, the technology that exists today. So the first project is work I did while I was at Disney Research uh, in Pittsburgh uh, and at Carnegie Mellon uh, with my collaborators uh, Eric Brockmeyer, Scott Hudson, uh, and Ivan Pupareff. So uh, this work looks at three different areas. Uh, the first one being uh, different types of displays we can create with optical material. Uh, the second one being different types of sensors we can make for input. Uh, Again, using optical material, uh, and finally, uh, different types of illumination we can we can uh, we can create just from a design perspective using this material. Uh, so I'm going to go through these uh, one by one. So we base this on a, a number of sort of technical things we can do in terms of how we can guide and reflect light. Uh, and the first of those is is, is dealing with uh, light pipes, which are basically you know fiber optic like structures that instead of being uh, created with you know conventional manufacturing techniques, we actually just make from a software file. So this is a, a couple of different materials we use. Uh, you can see the structure here. You, you shine the light on one side, and basically the materials are such that uh, the light internally reflects, and it can bend around corners. Um, this is a animation here. Uh, we didn't quite figure out how to, how to slow down light. Um, that would have been pretty cool. But uh, this is the internal structure, so you can see that it, it's much like a regular fiber optic cable. It has this sort of core and this cladding around it, which has a different uh, index of refraction. Uh, and then, of course, we can add an arbitrary sort of case around that that can take on any shape. Uh, and of course, uh, this is work done at Disney, so none, no better shape to use than some cute little character. Uh, so the, we looked at how we could make uh, these sort of snap-on displays for, in this case, mobile projectors. So this is a little. A uh, little character here. Um, I, I'm not sure if we want to pass these around but you can come up, uh, and check them out later on. Uh, and basically we can project a, the little eyes of the character, like pizza? Uh, ask it really important questions, <laughs> uh, and it can respond. So uh, the idea here is that really we can basically map a display to any Wake surface up. on an object uh, basically by you know projecting into the bottom of it. But also we could you know take another form factor which would be a, a in this case, it's a tabletop display, but it could be you know, your iPad or whatever, uh, and, and map that light that's kind of being blocked by that object uh, onto another surface that's visible. 
So this is uh, one example of uh, a, a little chess chess game, and you're displaying uh, you know the, the the location of the pieces on the on the on the, on the piece itself. So we uh, add some little uh, tags to the bottom of these optical tags, and we can basically track and project onto that that location uh, where the chess piece is. So another, another technique uh, we use to, to guide and reflect light is these tiny internal reflectors uh, that sit inside of this uh, you know, piece of polished uh, plastic. So these basically, again, this is an animation just to show, but basically they reflect light that, that is uh, you know, shined into that piece. Uh, and basically what we can do is we can sort of map these out into a three-dimensional space uh, such that uh, each of these each of these little bubbles in this in this object can be, uh, you know, addressed individually from a, a 2D projector. So we're doing a you know really simple example, simple prototype. Uh, this is what it looks like as you're looking through this sort of field of bubbles. Uh, we can basically hit those and you know, bounce a ball around. Um, so it's it's a really uh, simple proof of concept, but you know it kind of opens up the space of how you can design the inside of these objects as well. Uh, so these 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 shapes don't just need to be uh, little bubbles. They can actually be tubes and a, and a few other shapes as well. Um, so we can also make other characters that have uh, the you know little shapes inside of them. In this case, it's a little heart, and basically you can put it on top of a, a little LED, uh, and its heart's gonna gonna beat inside. Uh, you know, just uh, like that. So the next next category uh, is about sensors and. We're really looking here at how we can basically design uh, these objects uh, so that they can not only display the content, but we can take input from, uh, from the user and uh, interpret that. So we created a whole bunch of different ways of working with light and optical sensors uh, so that we can sense you know, simple things such as you know, the push of a button. So here, uh, light is being shown along this uh, LED, from an LED through this uh, waveguide, I guess and into uh, a little photo detector on the other side. And basically this creates this really nice analog reading and you can basically get a nice little sensor. So this is essentially comes out of the printer. You, you insert these two uh, basic uh, little uh, sensors, a sort of LED and a, and a, and a photo transistor into it. Uh, and then you can create any number of, of different uh, motion sensing devices. So you know these could be dials, could be sliders, uh, could be uh, even this sort of crude optical accelerometer. Uh, so there's many different things you can, can, can do with that. Uh, you can also, through another slightly different approach, you can sense, sense touch. And so this is using uh, light that, that, that sort of shines through this plastic body and basically it reflects some amount of light back into the sensor uh, and gives you a touch input on a, on a 3D printed uh, surface. So you know, one example is to make a little game controller. Uh, you can you know, insert your uh, little sensors inside of it uh, during the, the printing process uh, and basically that makes it this really, really uh, robust little object uh, and of course you can sense the touch input on each of those surfaces. The final, uh, final category of work is, is really looking at more the design perspective and how we can you know, guide and reflect light to, to make you know, things that look pretty. So, one of the ways we do this is by inserting uh, LEDs into, into these objects. Uh, I have a few examples up here you can check out. The, uh, the basic process is such that uh, you can make you know, different shapes inside of these, 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 uh, these objects to, to, to spread light out, focus it in, uh, or split it in, in a couple of different directions. Uh, and, you can see we, we do this by, uh, you know, first of all, starting with some digital file, uh, and then stopping the printer uh, in the in sort of mid mid print, start in, inserting these LEDs, uh, and then go ahead and like close it up, and the end product after you've sort of sanded this down a little bit is this uh, this the structure here. So, so based on that, um, we created like a range of different light bulbs that are the sort of play on the you know what, what a conventional light bulb is, is going to look like. Um, so there's a couple examples here, but basically uh, these are you know regular LED attachments, and of course like a light bulb doesn't really need to look like a light bulb if it's um, like an Edison light bulb. Uh, we're inserting these 
tiny little bubbles into it to create you know, unique uh, reflections inside of the object. Uh, you know, having little light pipes that are going to bend the light around uh, inside, uh, as well as uh, you know, you know, this is the the, the, the tribute to Edison here of uh, you know making a, a for example a solid block that can have a design all of itself inside of it. So uh, again, the, the the process here is we're sort of using different software to to set the location of these these individual uh, bubbles inside of the object. Uh, and then we have this uh, hardware that's built into that that we insert. So basically we can attach these really easily to any, any uh, light bulb. Uh, and this is the sort of sped up 3D printing process. Uh, and it, of course at the end it sort of there's, we haven't really figured out a really great way to, to, to sand these things down. So that, that part of it is, is still, uh, still done manually. But the end product at the end, uh, is is this, you know, pretty clear object that you can you know polish up and then uh, attach uh, to the light bulb. So it's it's great looking at this, at, you know, at high speed because it took so much so much time to like <laughs> to, to sand that down. It's like. Um, so there's a number of obviously technical issues uh, that occur with the approach we're doing for the light pipes, for example. So uh, the resolution of the you know current generation printers is is, is still limited. Uh, so you know if you look at a cross section of, of of these pipes, you can see that you know the the, the circles are not circular uh, and the tubes are not really tubular. So everything is is, is very rough. So as a result, you know, you, you, the, the transmittance you get from a 3D printed light pipe is, is really nowhere near on the level of commercial optical fiber, which is just almost like 99.999%. So um, you're not going to send, uh, you know, transatlantic communication with this. Uh, but I think for the purpose of making small objects, it, it, it works, you know, reasonably well. Uh, we also developed a number of different techniques for, for smoothing the surface of, 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 of these objects. Um, and this works you know, for really uh, low profile things, but it's, it's difficult if it's a much larger object. Um, so obviously you can see like this is an example of some 3D printed uh, little lenses, and each of these is like about five, five millimeters uh, in diameter. Uh, so I'm gonna switch up gears now and, and talk about another project uh, called Infrastrux, and this is what I, I worked on uh, with Andy Wilson at Microsoft uh, Research. Um, and this is kind of still this, idea of uh, using optical sensing uh, and the idea of using you know new fabrication techniques uh, to enable you know, different types of interaction with with computers uh, and, it, and it's really motivated by this this uh, this problem of how objects are made right now and like mass produced in these sort of I'm not saying mass produced but like produced in these sort of 3d printing factories so this is like how shapeways literally uh, goes about like creating you know a whole bunch of 3D printed objects. So they, they have this sort of powder process. Uh, and they're literally like pulling these objects out of this huge stack of powder. Um, and all of these things, like some of them, you know, look really, really similar. Uh, they're all the same color. <laughs> they're going to get lost. Uh, and then after that, they get, uh, you know, put in this like post processing to smooth them out, like to sand them down basically. Uh, and so anyway, at the end of this, like, I don't know how they, how they keep track. Actually, they have to keep track of these things some way. And the guy actually told me that when I, he came up to me after giving a talk at SIGGRAPH, he was like, the way we actually keep track of these is like by weighing them. So like we have an object and we have a kind of like a rough guess of how much it weighs. And that's like really terrible. So there's this is kind of crazy amount of logistics involved in like tracking these individual objects. And this hasn't really existed before because uh, in, in, in typical manufacturing, you get a hundred of the same thing or a million of the same thing out. It doesn't really matter which is which. Whereas here, it's like it actually matters. They are all like very similar. Uh, so the motivation here is like, how do we figure out a way of uh, identifying these objects? And like, and if we can if we can identify them, I mean that's great, just for these purely uh, logistical purposes. But on top of that, you know, there's interesting ways we can interact with them. Um, so one of the interesting things you can do with 3D printing is to actually use uh, the internal geometry, right? So you can't really define internal geometry. Uh, through any other manufacturing process with any amount of reliability, right? So you can't, you know, injection mold an Eiffel Tower inside of a <laughs> inside of something else. It's 
not doing that with any accuracy is, is really difficult. Uh, so if we combine that with the ability to see inside of the objects, you know, I was thinking it'd be some interesting things you could do uh, in terms of embedding information in these objects. Uh, and this particular project looks at uh, sort of the very, very end of the optical spectrum, which is this uh, terahertz range, which is between, you know, radio waves and, and optical. Uh, and basically, uh, you know, terahertz imaging looks like this. If you take your little PCB circuit board, if you cover it with a, uh, you know, layer of uh, plastic that's, you know, invisible and infrared, it essentially creates this, this time domain image of, of, of multiple reflections, uh, you know, reflecting back from that object. So you can see it's, it's kind of a volumetric data set, uh, which is really, really interesting. Uh, and the basic principle is, is, is it, sends out this emitted signal uh, from each layer. It bounces, uh, bounces back a reflection. Uh, and essentially, you can, you can use that to sort of recover some structure inside of the object. Uh, so what these machines look like, you know, they're super expensive. They're kind of like used for industrial purposes of quality control. Um, is, is essentially like, it looks like a projector. It looks like a little projector. And you can put your, uh, for example, object and we call this a sort of infrastructure tag. And this is an object that has a bunch of different layers inside of it. If you put that underneath this, uh, underneath this, this, this see-through scanner, uh, you can recover this, uh, the data you're seeing here. That's this volumetric stack, if you like. Uh, so the thought here is that if we can actually encode uh, kind of defects into, this, into the 3D printed object, uh, then we can you know, fab obviously we can fabricate that with 3D printing, uh, and then we can, you know, recover that using uh, using this see-through uh, scanning technique. Uh, and, and the basic idea is that we have uh, the defects are essentially a difference in index of refraction. So you have this sort of high material, which is a high re high refractive index material, and a low material, uh, and just sort of put as bits inside of an enclosure, uh, and essentially this gives you back this this nice little signal. Uh, that, that gives a pulse, a uh, sort of strong reflection where there's a, where there's a one, and, and basically sort of not really much of a reflection when there's a zero. Uh, and we went about sort of designing a, a bunch of different tag designs that could, uh, could potentially, you know, be used for different purposes. So uh, these tags are, you know, some of them are 3D printed in their entirety. Others of them are sort of layered, layered uh, stacks. Um, and there's some sort of technical issues in terms of what you can and cannot make. Uh, but essentially, the, the, the data you can scan comes in sort of three different varieties. So you can actually get quite a rich signal just from one pulse. Uh, so even with one pulse, you could, for example, encode uh, like this gray code stru structure. So this is you know, literally layers of, of, of sandwiched together uh, thin film. Uh, and it has this sort of gray code in physically encoded into it. And just with one pulse, you can actually get recover the sort of x, y location. Uh, so that that's sort of where your where this beam is is penetrating the, this physical object. Uh, so this is what it looks like on the inside. Uh, you have this uh, you know signal that goes through and it reflects back, uh, and you can basically encode this information uh, to get back the the sort of the signal. So you can see where the where it goes through the cover very clearly, and then this 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 wavy signal where that comes out the other end. Um, and even a very, very simple uh, 3D printed objects that just have these, this sort of basic, you know, geometry inside of them, um, you can get some really interesting signals back. So uh, this is looking at how, you know, a series of sort of inverted pyramids uh, gives you this, this real-time signal back about, you know, essentially you can derive whereabouts they're located uh, underneath this, this scanner. Um, so just like a, a sort of shift in the y direction, uh, you know, changes that signal from this, this sort of short uh, reflection to a long reflection. Uh, and even, even adding sort of random voids inside of this object actually gives you, you know, some idea if you're doing a, an entire scan of that object, uh, you know, of its, obviously its identity, uh, but also its, its orientation within a, a sort of known model. So uh, you can look at, you know, there's a bunch of little ear bubbles essentially we, we put inside of this and then we can uh, recover uh, those using that scanned data. So I, I think there's uh, some interesting potential applications. I mean, obviously, like just, just dealing with the, a whole range of, you know, near, nearly similar but not quite similar objects uh, and having to uh, identify those is really interesting. Uh, but I also think there's interesting things you can do if you can see through, uh, you know, 
objects and like f you can basically you can make something you can identify it embed this code uh, and then see through to what's on the other side uh, was, would be really interesting um, and also just being able to you know identify these these objects in more sort of day-to-day -day, you know scenarios so what if you know, your little robot wants to pick up your toys I uh, can figure out the ones and where they go so there's a bunch of different uh, limitations to this obviously this this, this technology is like super immature and it's 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 very very expensive um, and some funny interactions happen when you when you get like 3D 3D printed objects uh, that have this this sort of periodic structure that's very similar to the wavelength of this electromagnetic radiation that you're putting into it. So you get some weird attenuation, uh, and so some materials you know don't work as well as others. Um, and overall, the materials like the, the index of refraction, and that's what this relies on to get a really good signal, uh, is pretty similar for all the all of these different 3D printed materials. So they're all sort of polymers, uh, you know, plastics. Uh, so just using them by themselves is, is not, you know, is not ideal. Uh, having little tiny little defects is actually turns out to be the best, the best way. So, uh, you know, in summary, I think, I think this whole work is really about, you know, ways we can build up this toolkit of, of, of you know, things for, uh, techniques for displays and techniques for uh, sensors. Uh, techniques for illumination and, and te techniques also for, for tagging these objects. Uh, and I think that's it's really interesting to see if, how we can build this toolkit and to now enable people to make these uh, more complicated and, and active objects in the future. So uh, obviously I think you know it's, it's moving towards that direction of how do we make how do we make a, a, a fully you know 3D printed device that, that contains all this uh, interesting uh, functionality. Uh, so right now, um, just to skip back, to, I'm actually in Autodesk, and and we're um, so sort of had this new facility that our CEO opened up, and this is him like cutting the ribbon uh, in San Francisco. This is like in Pier Nine, and uh, they kind of made this big metal ribbon, and he's like a kind of real, you know, maker guy. He likes making stuff. Uh, so anyway, we basically opened up this facility, and we're really uh, interested in working with other people and looking at how we can you know, use these manufacturing and fabrication tools, uh, you know, whether that's sort of high, really expensive like uh, CNC mills or um, you know, water, jet, water jet cutters or, or lays and all this kind of stuff, laser cutters, uh, 3D printers, uh, and, and see how we can you know, collaborate, how we can figure out what is going to be the, the sort of next exciting thing that we can do with, with uh, making you know, the software that's going to, going to drive all this stuff. So, um, actually, there's, there's even a test kitchen. So if you're interested, in, if you're interested in cooking as well, you know we can do that as well. So uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff. It's it's a pr it's a pretty fun uh, playground. If you're interested uh, in, in coming and checking it out, do let me know. Um, so that's that's uh, pretty much me, and uh, I'm welcome to to have any questions. So I have some samples. Um, if anyone wants to check them out, you're welcome to like come up and have a look. <laughs> um, yeah, as I said, like there's some that are quite easy to see. Uh, I have a little light here, and you can like put some of these on your iPhone and actually see the sort of the 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 quality you get, I guess, and the and the sort of the resolution you get from uh, you know light going through 3D printed ones. Uh, these guys you can open up and you can actually see what's inside, but from the outside, it's kind of pretty boring. <laughs> the, the resolution seems like a major bottleneck here. Do you think that this is something that the hardware manufacturers are on and, are, and it's going to get better? Or is this something that's just going to stick around until you know, people somehow figure out how to, how to lay these, these things down with more precision? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's... it's it's not dissimilar from photolithography, right? That's used for you know making chips, right? And that's what is that down to like twenty something nanometers now? So I mean that's that's kind of pretty good. <laughs> so I mean yeah, that's like an order of magnitude. That's like thirty mi micron. So it's it's you know uh, I mean there are three D printers that I think have been made like for uh, for doing like much uh, you know. High resolution stuff. The thing is, is that once you get 
down like to those feature sizes, it, it just takes forever to, to, to make anything, right? So you can make a tiny little thing that's like, super high resolution, which is fine if it's a, like a, a silicon chip, right? Uh, but if you actually want to make a really large thing that's going to be like super detailed, it's, yeah, you're just, uh, it's, a, it's a scale thing. So uh, it would be the same, I think, if you're doing, you know, if you're building an architecture, like architecture building structure, you just don't need that, right? So you need, you need speed and you need a better you know, make that large structure, so. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's probably gonna be some hybrid ways to do that, like, you know, the outside can be high resolution, the inside can be low resolution, so. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, in your examples, the illuminating elements, so like a LED light or something, was always a discrete component that you later attach yeah. or embed sure. into the 3D printer. Mm -hmm. Is there technology to actually uh, build that in, like, print the LED mm -hmm. substrate? Yeah, yeah. There's like the printed electronics community is, is kind of where where that stuff is happening. So yeah, definitely. But but in terms of uh, making three dimensional structures with that, no, nothing. Nothing is commercially available. Yeah. You mentioned uh, having a process for smoothing uh, the optics in low profile objects. Is that some sort of post processing or? No, that's it. That's actually done in the machine. So. Uh, in the paper, it sort of describes it in more detail, but essentially it's, it's sort of uh, putting down material in, in such a way uh, where it's sort of spraying it from a, in a uniform layer. Uh, and basically it sort of, because it's, it's sort of, essentially if you, if you allow the material more time to cure, if you don't cure it straight away, it sort of smooths over, and that's essentially like how we did it inside of the machine. So. Yes. So are innovations in this area considered more copyright or um, are they considered um, patents or what, what's the yeah. nature of the innovation? Uh, you, me personally or just in 3D printing yeah, in, in general? general? In general. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 3D printing is, is a pretty, pretty aggressive uh, <laughs> kind of curve going upwards of patents filed. Uh, so yeah, there's definitely like a lot of, uh, a lot of IP and there's, like, there's lawsuits that are kind of coming about like in the last year or a uh, year and a half. So. Are people having success with copywriting designs? Um, are people having success with copywriting designs? Uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen anything about copyright too much. I mean, I guess you generally hear the copyright conversation where it's uh, about companies like Disney, for example, um, you know, like that, they're the ones I guess who are, who are more concerned about it. But uh, to be honest, I'm not like super, <laughs> super knowledgeable about, knowledgeable about the, the copyrights side of it. I mean, one thing I was wondering is what method you're using within it, because often in 3D printing you'll get very distinct layers getting optical clarity throughout that maintaining that seems like it would be a really big challenge that you guys mostly solve. Uh, we'll see, I mean, we're, we're using off-the-shelf uh, machines, right? So, I mean, I think, I think it, it's, a, it's a difference between like using a, a liquid resin, which is what we use, and, and using like a sort of thermoplastic filament. So like that's like really discrete layers where this is like basically sort of, you know, wets into that previous layer so much that it's, it becomes clear at the end. So the transmissivity is like 90%, 60%? Oh, no, it's, 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 I don't think it's 90% at all, but uh, I'm not exactly sure on the statistic, but um, yeah, it's, 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 it's not perfect. I mean, it, I think there's some, yeah, the clarity of the materials, uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of things that make it yellow, for example, like upon a exposure to UV light. So that's kind of affects, affects it, but, and it's also slightly depends on the direction that you print as well, so. Yeah. So I'm, I'm reflecting a little bit on the generativity of this approach. From many years when we had software user interface design, let's say like Java Swing, yeah. um, it was sort of, you could look at it and you could sort of copy and steal, but you'd have to re implement. Right. Right. And one of the major things that I think changed the game of the web mm -hmm. was essentially all design became open source. Right. Because HTML and CSS <laughs> were such that you could sort of yeah. look at, inspect, extract, and apply to your own website. Yeah. Um, and it occurs to me that, you know, of course if you have the files, you can recreate this. Yeah. But, you know, especially if you're willing to sort of destroy the thing you're looking at, all right. designs here, uh, given the high, high precision sensing instrument, become open source. Yeah. Right? Like I can just take my... Uh, 
my little Disney dude <laughs> thrown inside of like a high precision sander and optical scanner right, right and actually yeah. get something to go. It seems like it could become a really interesting space for people remixing, riffing mm -hmm. on other people's designs. I, copyright, I'm sure, will be an interesting question. But yeah. there's, it seems like that that is a potentially very open <coughs> field. Um, right. I, I think the, the remixes and that kind of stuff is happening more in the digital realm right now, like the, than sort of people using expensive hardware to figure out like your design. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that stuff happens in with the regular manufacturing right now. Yeah, I mean, it's. You just take it apart. Yeah, yeah, I think it, I think that exists in certain places. Um, <laughs> so you know whether whether three D printing uh, you know accelerates that or, or not, I'm not I'm not entirely sure. But uh, yeah, it's it's a very good point. Yeah, thoughts, questions? Oh, yeah. So uh, I'm sort of curious about this. All of the three D printing uh, artifacts that you showed are extremely high precision, and they seem to be yeah. very scientifically engineered. Right. And okay. yeah. on the other hand, you have, with woodworking, for instance, mm -hmm. you have craft people who just mm -hmm. you know, decide, oh, I'm going to do this this way because it feels right mm -hmm. to, to have this sort of right. contour here. Uh, do, you, do you see any of that craft coming in into 3D printing? Um, right. I mean, I think, I think it can come in there, but it's, it's more a matter of like the design tool you use. Like, it's more of a digital thing, right? So it's like, you know, sketching or... or, or interacting with that side of it. So basically it's, yeah, I mean, the, the end product is, is essentially pretty well defined, right? So you have a file and it goes to print and it comes out like that. But I mean, there's any number of processes, like people use this, I mean, an example is like, uh, I think I saw a talk at CES like by Legacy, of, Legacy FX, I believe, and they like, they sort of take the basic shell and then like they cast that in silicone and they do a bunch of other stuff and paint on top of it. So I mean, that's definitely there. You can definitely have those sort of multi-layer processes.